The Unshackled Waves, episode 219. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. One new friend we've made in the alt media community over the past few months is Daniel Wagner, who runs the YouTube channel and blog Unframe of Mind. Based in the United States, Unframe of Mind discusses socio-political events and philosophical ideas. Its tagline is Uncomfortable Conversations Without a Condom. He is a good friend of fellow Aussie YouTubers Dia Beltran and James Fox Higgins. He now hosts a regular segment on James's Rational Rice channel called Untriggered. I've already appeared on one of his live streams last year, so I thought it'd be a good idea to introduce him to the Unshackled audience properly and learn a bit more about his views and beliefs. Daniel, welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on, man? Hey, Glad well, to... it's quite late over here in Australia. I understand it's early morning over there in the in the States. You're an early riser, I've heard. <laughs> well, I can be. It, it's a, a lot of my friends happen to be in Australia so it just so happens that I have to get up sometimes as early as you know 3 30 o'clock 3 30 in the morning just to be able to you know schedule the time I'm a night owl so yeah it works out perfectly for both of us right on yeah you know, I've, I've always been a night owl it's just my work schedule just makes it so that I have to I have no choice but to get up early if I ever want to talk to you guys now, I'll start with talking about uh, your channel, Unframe of Mind. First of all, what does it actually mean? Unframe of Mind? Um, well, dude, we sat there and put together, um, it was me and two other guys at the time, we, we put together probably a list of 150 different possible names that we could, we could call this thing. It's like just trying to take these general ideas and, and put them in a giant bucket and shake them around and see what came out of it. And the, the one that ended up winning was Unframe of Mind. And what what that means is it, it's basically, you know, we, we're kind of noticed that a lot of people are in their own little box. They're, 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 they, they put these labels on themselves and others and then create this kind of division between each other. You know, I'm, I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I am a man and I'm a woman. And these are, you know, these are the fighting, warring sides of, of, a, of whatever the political debate may be. And we just decided, you know what, let's think outside the box let's let's um let's open the box a little bit and and allow people to kind of blend and meld and 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 actually interact with each other and that ended up birthing the the whole tagline that we have is uncomfortable conversations without a condom and that that was that was like all right we're gonna have open-ended free speech without any filters we're just gonna talk and not be angry at each other and we're just going to have a good time while we're doing it. It's going to be funny. It's going to be a little dirty sometimes. And it's just going to be, you know, just us being us having the conversations we were having behind closed doors anyway. The description of your channel, it's very uh, provocative. <laughs> conversations without a condom. It, ma it makes, well, I guess that sex sells. And so when you mention that, it sort of gains people's attention. Yeah, a little bit. It's funny. I'll, I'll be driving along, um, and I have a bumper sticker on my car that has it on there. And I'll notice I'll, I'll be sitting there at a, at a stoplight, and I'll look behind me in the rearview mirror, and I'll see the person like tapping the, the, the their passenger next to him and pointing at it and giggling and stuff. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. So I, I know it's drawing attention. It's just a matter of getting more exposure at this point. Now, Unframe of Mind, it's, well, it's sort of like The Unshackled. It's a mixture of YouTube, podcasts, and articles. You uh, try to be on as many uh, platforms as possible. Can you uh, describe the what you aim to achieve in each of the different formats? Uh, describe what I aim to achieve? Um, goodness, uh, probably just overall exposure at this point. I, I have a need to create. I love just making shit basically and, and it's 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 innate in me and um whatever form that takes is is i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and use whatever format best suits that particular creative endeavor um whether it's going to be a youtube live stream with guests or it could be an article where i've really sat down and spelled out my arguments and really taken the time to go back and you know i'm, I'm really good with writing so that's probably one of my favorite things to do but Unfortunately, a lot of people don't really get attracted to the writing as much as the video format. 
So it's it's kind of a give and take. Podcast format is is sometimes it's better for um, instances where the, the guest might want to be anonymous or, you know, most most of my podcasts are taking my live stream shows from YouTube and just converting them to audio format for for basically for ease for people to be able to listen to it. Because I know we have an, you know, an hour show sometimes most of the time. And a lot of people aren't sitting around watching hour long shows on YouTube, but they are putting in earplug earbuds while they're at work and listening to it there. So it's just making it more convenient to get a message out. Even though you research your articles, uh, when I was uh, reading them in preparation f uh, for this show, I noticed that they're uh, a lot more silly, albeit uh, they're intellectual, but they're a lot more silly than uh, your podcasts or live streams I found. Oh, you said silly? Yes. <laughs> right. So, like, what what would be an example of something that stood out? Like, what do you what do you? Well, when I was reading, and we'll get to it in a moment, your one on uh, democracy, that was right. It, it was quite a well reasoned article. It was just written in a very silly and humorous way. Oh yeah, you know that that's for me. That's kind of one way that I absorb new ideas a lot easier it's like you know the, the little sugar makes the medicine go down you know theory it, it just it, it makes it a lot more fun for me to write it it makes it a lot more fun for people to read it and it still uh, serves the purpose of causing people to think outside of their preconceived box I'm probably a bit more provocative and out there in my articles than I am on these uh, shows. I'm more measured and thought out where, uh, where when you're behind a keyboard, you sort of have, because no, you're not sort of self-conscious that uh, people are, are watching you in, in the moment, you sort of feel a bit more liberal to sort of write in whatever way that you feel. It's like like the uh, the ability to edit. You know, you have the ability to have multiple drafts. Where a live yes, show, yeah. you just gotta go. Like, you wouldn't believe how many shows um, right before we go live. I'm sitting there like frantically finishing up my notes or getting my my post ready to go, and then we're we're just smashing the inner button and sending them out and printing. And it's, we're clipping it to the camera, and then we're clicking live, and we're like, okay. Go. <laughs> it's like it's like the chaos before the storm, and then and then it just goes from there, and then we just take it or leave it. We get what we get, and I and I leave in all the flaws whenever whatever happens. I mean, it's it's live. You you don't really have much choice, but it's a lot of fun. I I enjoy it. I don't do too much live at this stage, basically, because whenever I do, there's always something which goes wrong. When that, that's why I do most of my episodes pre-recorded, because uh, if if something goes wrong, I can pause and fix it. Like there's something going wrong at the moment, but in this recording, but our viewers and listeners, they won't know uh, only that I've mentioned it. Yeah, well, well, if you go back and watch many of the live shows, man, you just got to roll with it. I mean, I'd say it's better it's better to just have something out there than try to get it perfect. And with the live shows, people don't exactly expect perfection. It's it's like there's been multiple times where like the entire feed will cut out and I'll end up jumping back into the stream. It's like, ah, oh, that's frustrating, but it just is what it is. Technology's a finicky little bitch, so you just got to work with her, you know? Now, Unframe of Mind is a side project of yours. Uh, well, some people would put it more crudely, say it's a vanity project. Uh, you have a, uh, a main uh, job and you're also uh, a family man. So you've got a lot to, you're juggling a lot. I say, and, and I'm the director of marketing for a cryptocurrency company as well. Yikes. <laughs> Didn't you yeah. write an article saying that was like the lottery? No, 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 uh, man. It's it's like I, I get too many projects on my plate at once, and and, I, and, I, and it's a, it's a reoccurring theme in my life. It's been happening for years. Where I'll just I, I I love doing so many different things, and as I get interested in projects, I just keep bringing more and more on my plate, more and more on my plate, and then I realize, oh, I'm feeling really overwhelmed. Time to stop, take stock of what's important here. And remove the rest for for now. Well, you know, I've got notebooks upon notebooks of other ideas that I want to do, and I just don't have the infrastructure or the time to be able to do them just yet. But one day, maybe we'll see. Well, Unframe of Mind, it's been going for more than two years, so you've stuck at it. I remember when I started the Unshackled, there was heaps of other startup uh, blogs similar to ours, but we're the only ones that uh, persisted. 
I mean, I mean, I, I we haven't seen as much success as I would like. Um, I know there's a, it's quite the market out there. There's lots of people trying to do this, and it's very competitive. So the fact that I do have people watching is pretty pretty incredible. You know, I appreciate the people, t- you know, actually take the time and come hang out with us. And there was actually there's there's a an app that I use for my YouTube channel called TubeBuddy, and that helps me with like keyword research and helps me with like YouTube shortcuts and things like that. It's a pretty cool program. You might check it out, but they had like a a stock video it it was like created from the stats of my last year and it just just came in my email uh, a couple days ago and it showed me like where i was at at the beginning of 2018 and the where i'm at at the end of 2018 and it was like oh we've actually been doing better than than i than it felt like we were doing like we've made pretty good progress so i it kind of like had some external source tap me on the shoulder and say hey it's cool, man. You're doing okay. Keep going. So it gave me gave me a little bit of more reassurance that we're heading in the right direction as far as stats and numbers go. Yeah, it's always nice when you you see a growth trajectory and just motivates you to to keep going. But enough about uh, our own vanity and talking about media. Let's get into some ideas now. Now you define yourself as an anarchist. Now in Australia, the term anarchist has a dirty connotation because it mainly is used to describe or denigrate uh, leftists, the the Antifa that run around in my home uh, city of Melbourne. They're, they're described as communists and anarchists, but you're an anarchist from the the libertarian mold and that's my political background in the uh, libertarian uh, movement so describe how your anarchism is different from the one that well most most people in our audience would be familiar with well it, it's not just in australia this is i think this is a worldwide phenomena and i think it's because worldwide you know we have governments in control and governments have a very interested and vested i'm sorry they have a vested interest in making sure that the population doesn't understand what anarchy truly is. So we have a scenario where everything ends up being chaos. Like anarchy equals chaos is is kind of the common idea. And that's kind of what I used to what I used to think. And it's it's like I learned what anarchy actually was. And then it kind of clicked something in my mind and made me go, oh, oh wait a minute. I can see why <laughs> every damn government in the entire world would have a, a an interest in making sure that people don't understand this and really all it means is opposite of government um no rulers that's it and a lot of people think it means no rules and that's totally different <laughs> in concept than than what i had originally thought you know you, you get this picture in your mind of like this mad max style world and everybody's going around throwing molotov cocktails is, is the is the meme basically associated with anarchy and that's just absolutely not the case um i even hear like a uh, host like mark levin talking about you know all these things the people on the left are doing and the, and he throws in chaos and this and that and i'm with him every step of the way until he says the word anarchy and i'm like you know that one's wrong the rest of them are perfect descriptions for what you're talking about except that one <laughs> the thing that uh, because i've explored uh, the idea of anarcho-capitalism anarchy uh for a number of years and i've always thought about how it would work in reality and the the thing the main criticism that i have on it is how do you know that all of these different people and businesses that uh, basically make sure that society functions how do you stop one of them going rogue and, and basically trying to become the the tyrant of of society i mean what if uh, one company starts whacking its rivals for example oh you mean like what you just described in my mind was government you know they are the ultimate control and power they are they actually have the legal right to go and whack their opponents wherever they see fit you know they have to do it in a very politically astute way but they're the ones that legally have the power to do so that's basically what you just described and it's like well what would we do if we didn't have them around like it would look like exactly what you're describing it didn't make any sense uh, i i hope i was clear on that but how in an anarchist society how would you stop one 
company deciding that that's the that's the way to basically make sure it's successful going around whacking and intimidating its rivals i mean yeah you've described you don't need to tell me how evil the government is i mean uh i i i know that they're they're not too dissimilar from organized crime but you've got to basically say well how do you know that your anarchy society wouldn't just be a whole bunch of organized crime gangs running society oh kind of like what today is i got it but some <laughs> organized crime gangs running society yeah that would be terrible so i agree with you that would be terrible and and basically, I mean, if 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 you understand basics of economics and whatnot, is like, it's it's actually a lot more valuable to create a product somebody wants than to attempt to create a product somebody wants and also destroy your enemies at the same time so that they can't create a product somebody wants. Like, there's just too much too much extra um, effort and money and cost going into that, and. It, it causes you know that 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 idea of competition is fantastic. It, it makes people on their game. It makes people step up to the plate and be better. There's also the idea that you know if say I'm a company and I'm going out whacking people, you know I've got to deal with some major PR shit because people do have the ability to decide whether or not to work with us. You know you'll have you you can still have major media networks that say hey listen these guys are out there whacking people or they're building up a, a military of their own or what have you, and people can make the decision whether or not to shop with that person or not or to you know be a patron of their business. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, it does. That well, if the government or well, the government's been killing people for what. Uh forever and you know they're they're still in business but in the society that you've described if a business is whacking people then uh, not many people are going to want to deal with them because hey if I, I come into a disagreement with them forever how mild they're going to come after me so basic basically the the how we get there is not as important to me as the principles behind uh, whether it's wrong or not, you know, I, I, I'm sure you would agree that theft is wrong, that stealing is is immoral, that you shouldn't do that. And if you look at the definition of the of of, of uh, taxation versus theft, it's basically the exact same thing. The only minor difference is that one is legal and one's not. That's that's really the only difference between the two. And it's like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Legal doesn't necessarily mean right, because if that was the case, there was a time in history when slavery was legal. Doesn't make it right. We fought tooth and nail to get that shit taken care of. And it's like if I was to tell people back in the day who were, uh, you know, big slave owners that, listen, in the future, we're going to have these giant machines that, you know, they, they, they use – you know, old dinosaur fossils to run on, and they will do the work of a thousand men much easier, much more efficiently. You know, basically talking about combine harvesters and all that kind of thing. That you'd look at me like I'm I'm insane. <laughs> like that would make no sense to you. It's like we had no concept of the possibilities of what could be, as long as we're continuing to do things the way we're doing them. So that's much more important to me in the long run. Don't you remember signing this uh, social contract that we are all in this society and that we all agree that taxation is is necessary to fund essential services? I sense a slight note of sarcasm in your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that's just that's the difference is I don't have the choice to interact with my government or not. Like they can do what they want. I have no choice. I I can't opt out. I can't say Listen, I I know I know you guys got these cool programs going on, you know, where when I get old that I'll have my medical co you know benefits covered and you know the this disability insurance and stuff, but you know, I'd rather take my chances and just not pay the taxes and and you know, if I fail then let me fail. You know, let me fall on my face. Don't don't try to save me. I I chose not to participate. That's my own fault. It's it'd be just like saying I chose not to have fire insurance for my house. My, my house is burnt down now. That's my own fault. I have nobody to blame but me. But I don't have that choice. I, I, I would love to have that choice because I would – I think most of us would choose to opt out of the entire system and then we'd kind of see the system for what it actually is. And then people would create their own private market solutions for these things because there would be an opportunity for competition. 
Ah, but you're forgetting that uh, people are stupid and that the people in government are smart. And so the, the reason why we need, for example, free healthcare is because people are too irresponsible to manage their, their own healthcare, manage a whole bunch of other things. And so we need the, the government there to be a big brother to, to make sure that if we do make stupid decisions in life, they're there to, to bail us out. Oh gosh, my question would be, how's that working out so far? I mean, <laughs> when you look around, I mean, you know, we, the government was supposed to stop all and, and end all poverty, but we have higher rates of poverty than we've ever seen before. Like, it's just getting worse. You know, we're supposed to be like this super responsible, super wealthy nation, but the debt and the, the deficit is so ridiculously out of control. And I'm sure your country's kind of headed the same direction based on the politics that I've been, you know, paying attention to. It's like, this is not the path to success where we're headed right now. Now, I'm not sure if you still consider yourself part of the, the libertarian movement or you were. I still consider myself a a libertarian. There seems to have been a fracturing over the past, I'd say, five years or so. Everyone was united when Ron Paul uh, came along, but everyone's gone their, their separate ways now. There's there's ones who've gone on the, the Trump train, such as myself. There's some who've gone over to the, the alt-right. There's some who've embraced the, the, the social justice uh, warrior uh, crusade. Where where do you fit into this? Where, where have you fractured to? And do, do you think, what, what's your view on how this has all panned out? Gosh, um, the, the concept of fractured to kind of implies that I was ever a part of. And I know you, in the beginning of your question, you, you did allude to that, but um, no, I, I, I never was part of the Libertarian Party not in any official sense. Um, oh, I not the party, but just right. Yeah, a lot. I mean, I'm I'm like a little L libertarian in a lot of ways. Um, basically, I just believe in personal freedom. Um, I do believe in the non-aggression principle, even farther than most libertarians would take it. Um, it meaning, I also include that you shouldn't hit kids <laughs> either. You shouldn't spank them. Um, that's that's kind of a, a bridge too far for a lot of libertarians. As far as fracturing out, man, I, I just I don't know. I've I've never I have a hard time putting myself in boxes because I, I allow myself the ability to be changed in light of new evidence and new 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 uh, information that I hadn't previously had. So, as a general rule, the only labels that I really allow myself is two two of them: anarchist and atheist. And the reason I use those labels is because they describe what I don't believe. They, they, they tell you nothing about what I actually do believe. If you want that information, you actually got to talk to me and we got to have dialogue and we got to have that conversation. But with those two labels, that's just taking a nice little sliver of saying, well, I don't believe these particular things. That's it. So you weren't uh, supportive of the, the Ron Paul presidential campaigns? As an anarchist, I'm not, I'm not supportive of any presidential campaigns. However, that being said... If I was to support a presidential campaign, I would prefer to have a libertarian in power than I would any other party, really, because they're the ones that are a lot closer to the ideal of anarchy as it stands. And they're, they're the ones that actually do seem to believe in smaller government, except for the SJW libertarians, which make no logical sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> what they say to people on, people on the left is if you want feminism, a society where you can identify as whatever gender or sexuality you want, you should embrace libertarianism because you can be free to be who you want to be. You can take whatever drug you want. Uh, you can engage in any sort of uh, pleasurable activity. That's their, their pitch. I, I mean, I, I guess that'd be okay. That I, I, I don't see any problem with that as long as it's not the government trying to control how you know <laughs> control everybody else that's that's perfectly fine with me but they seem to and this is why i disagree with them they seem to want to foster a mob for example if you don't use a gender neutral pronoun on someone who demands it then they're going to hound you and say uh, and say that you're a bigot and of course get you kicked off various uh, platforms which well they would say this is just the 
the free market, but it's just a form of, I'd say, private intimidation. Man, I think I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, you know, think think of it this way: if if I was actually able to be free and be who I want to be, and I and I don't have any fear that some other you know, bigot or racist is going to take control of the government and put limits on my ability to live free. I wouldn't have a second thought about hopping on Twitter and, you know, harassing somebody for believing that way. Like, I think that's really driven out of a state of fear where people feel like, oh, I'm, you know, part of the LGBTQRX plus one, et cetera, et cetera spectrum. And these other guys are over here saying that we shouldn't be allowed to exist, basically. Like, like they are a threat to our existence. And that's, like, this existential threat angle drives the whole need to, or, or the, the perceived need to go in and try to get these people, you know, fired, harassed, deplatformed, you know, break them down a notch. Because we don't want that. We don't want those people in power. Those, those people are bad. Those people are going to try to control us. And I can totally understand where that fear comes from. Even though it's completely irrational, I understand it. That's quite a succinct way to put it. Now, probably one of your most detailed articles is on democracy or well, how to win elections. And well, it's talking about US elections. And I want to make the point that in Australia, our elections and democracy are way better than in the United States, for example polling station on election day pretty much in every local school and we vote on a Saturday when I voted in our recent state election uh, there was only three people in line in front of me and even then I, I was saying oh this is too long to to wait we don't have uh, electronic uh, voting we have a independent uh, electoral commission we don't outsource our electoral processes to various uh, corporations. So America, supposedly the, the bastion of democracy, I think. Well, the only downside of Australia is that we have compulsory voting. You're forced to vote, which you'd probably hate. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, if, if, if you had a chance to read the article, then, then you'll know my feelings on voting in, in, in particular. I just I don't vote because I don't believe in participating in a system of evil. It's like, well, <laughs> wait a minute. If the entire foundation of this entire, you know, enterprise is based on the fact that you have to steal money from people in order to operate against their will, and I can choose not to participate in that, I'm going to take every opportunity I can to not participate in that. If that means not claiming the benefits that I'm supposedly entitled to, I won't do that. If that means I don't have to vote, I won't do that. I like e even I, I just I, I can't imagine being forced to vote. Like what happens? I'm curious if you don't vote, if you choose to like not do so. Uh, you get a fine of something like one hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, there's also because they're slowly moving to. It used to be. Uh, I mentioned that we use uh, paper voting, but they mark you off on the electoral roll on paper as well. So what you used to be able to, could be able to do is vote in say 50 polling booths and get marked off in each of the 50 polling booths because it was just on like a phone book of names, but you get mm -hmm. found out uh, later there, or they've updated somewhat so they have a a laptop now and they can tell if you've already voted so you could also do that yeah and, and it's amazing when you have a much simpler system for voting you know especially like if you if all we had was paper voting and then some kind of electronic verification so that people can go back and double check it i would have no need to have written this article like the, the basic idea for those who don't know is, is the article is written as as if I was giving advice to a to a, a politician running for office on all the different ways that you can rig and hack and, 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 and you know, jerry rig and everything else you can do to try to secure that vote you need to, to get that position of power you so strongly just got to have. The only way this is possible for, for all of these different violations to occur is by making the entire system so freaking complicated that nobody can really understand what's going on nobody can go back and double check nobody can see exactly the process that the the path of the vote took to get to where it was to to, to make sure that it even was the person that voted in the first place um e even the machines that we have like 
it blew my mind. That I thought that was going to be a minor part of the entire article when I did that part about the uh, who owns the voting machines. And I got in touch with a couple ladies that, that have been doing this for years, Lynn Landis and Bev Harris. And there's a, there's a small, um, about a 20-minute podcast associated with this article that I'd, re I'd fully recommend checking out. What these girls were telling me was, like, jaw-dropping. The, the, the amount of, uh, the ability for people to go in and alter the votes after they've been had, before they're actually turned in, is, is like, holy crap. And we have no idea who even owns the voting machines. <laughs> and every time you try to figure it out, they just hide behind much more legal frameworks of, of, of different shell companies and that kind of thing. And it's, like, impossible to find out who even owns the voting machines we're voting on. Like, that's a problem. Well, probably the only corporate connection to our electoral commission is who makes the, the, the paper voting uh, booths because we don't have the, the, the curtain where you uh, pull, the, pull the lever. We have these paper booths where you go in and fill out your paper ballot and well, I assume they either reuse them at the next election or send them, recycle them. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I mean, if it's if it feels, I mean, how do you how do you feel about that? Do you feel like your vote is actually being represented, and and, and do you feel like there's an opportunity for rigging? And, like, how do you how do you feel about that? Oh, well, we don't have. Also, I should have mentioned we don't have gerrymandering in Australia because, like I said, we have an independent electoral commission which decides the voting boundaries. Like some of the the shapes of the electoral uh, districts in the United States, I mean, they're, they're unbelievable. Like, if, they, if they're shaped like a moon, for example, I mean, where, where does the, the, the Congress person have their office? Like, do they have it in, like, the, the top bit of the moon or the bottom half of the moon? Somebody should also make a gerrymandered district in the shape of a penis just for a lol. Oh yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea. I mean, just 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 to prove a point, <laughs> or to make one that looks like a giant sucker, just to prove how much of how, how much these people are suckers for falling for this shit. <laughs> mm. I mean, how are you supposed to be represented if the district is scattered all over the city? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. You're not. You're not. I mean, the. the, the the whole, the whole, re the whole way that works is just they, they sit there and try to like carve out these lines around these certain neighborhoods that they know is going to vote for them, so that you can have the exact same amount of votes in a in a location. But if you divide them up a certain way, they'll end up almost always going toward the side that you want them to go for. And the only way to change that is for the other side to somehow get into power, and then they can redraw the district lines to benefit them. <laughs> like, like what the hell is that? Now, you said you describe yourself as an anarchist and an atheist. Let's focus on the, the atheist part. I'm an atheist as well, and despite us being quite strident atheists, we have a lot of uh, God-loving friends. Now, I'll first tell you the reason why I'm an atheist, and I consider it a belief, because atheism is a belief. I believe that there's nothing there or uh, there's nothing on the other side that we're here on this earth we have one chance at life we're here because this is how the the universe uh was formed i it just isn't possible in my way of thinking that there's this god who was able to create everything and he's all seeing and able to shape the the world in a in a, in a certain way Wait, wait, why, why not? Why, why don't, why do you think it's not possible? It's totally Be possible, dude. It, of course it's possible, but it's just, I don't think that that's the way that the universe works. It just doesn't seem like the logical explanation to me. You said you don't think, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, what, what I'm, what I'm kind of picking at is, is you said it's, it's, it's a, a belief, which kind of implies it's a positive affirmation. It's more so, I would say, a, it, it's it's explaining what you don't believe. I, I I mean that's at least that's the way I view it. It's it's, it's something that describes a a non-belief really, not not something that I actually do believe. Like I said, I, a agnostic is that where you don't you don't believe in a religion, but you don't know, you don't have a firm view. 
Right. Yeah, that would be agnostic where you're kind of like on the fence. Like, you know, I, I think I think only pussies reside in that area. It's like, yeah, dude, yeah. Stand, homie. Take a stand. <laughs> like, have some confidence in something. I've, I've never met a confident agnostic. Well, uh, they, they actually try to be more clever than than everyone while saying, well, I don't possibly know the answer to the universe question, so I take this uh, position, uh, which is totally above any of the religions or, or atheists. It, it's actually more arrogant than supposedly atheism is. Yeah, I'm. I'm just. I'm. I'm really. I'm really hung up on the the subtle difference between our our two versions, where you said uh, it, it's it's a belief. You 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 believe there is no god, and I just don't believe in a god. And I know it doesn't sound like a major difference to most people, but I think it's a pretty major difference in in so in so far as it's like th there is a little more confidence in what you're saying. I think is like. I, I believe, like, 100%, there's no God. This just doesn't make any sense. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I don't believe in a God. I don't believe yeah. it's it's possible. I, I don't believe it makes sense to me. Right, and I, and I guess from my perspective, it's a little different because I say I don't believe in God. It's different than saying I, don't, uh, I believe there is no God in that I kind of still allow myself, it's not an agnostic position, but I still allow the opportunity in my mind to be presented with evidence of a god. You know, I'm still open to the possibility, but... Then you're not a real atheist, in my opinion. As far as what I've seen so far, like, I don't, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. I, I don't have any reason to believe it. I'm, it's just simply saying I don't believe it. It's not saying 100% I it, it doesn't exist, which, I mean, if you pressed me for it, I would probably say 99%, 99.999%. No, no, there's no God. I, I'm pretty confident of it. But I'm still, I still allow the possibility, you know, I'm, I'm still open to the possibility. I've been proven wrong before is, is what I'm relying on in, in other things, in other arenas. And, you know, when, I, when I'm presented with the new evidence, it's like, Oh shit! I I either have to change my new belief or I have to just straight up ignore this new evidence as if I didn't even notice it. It's like there's still a possibility, maybe, could be. Problem is, you can't prove it one way or another. That's the problem. It's it's a it, unfalsifiable claim, and that's what makes it fall outside the purview of the scientific method. Uh, I don't think I could ever be convinced, yeah, despite the the best efforts of my religious friends. I mean, what they try to get me on is evolution and intelligent design. They're saying, do you know how the how unlikely it is that we're existing based on the, the, the probabilities, that it's just scientifically not possible that we are just perfectly created beings uh, by chance? Yeah, I, I, that makes that makes some sense if I'm from a from a Christian perspective, in a small-minded way, being that I don't think they truly understand the immense size of the universe. Yeah, <laughs> like that, if you that, consider that was my the response. immense, yeah, if you consider the immense size of it and really, really are honest about the immense size of it, the the probability that all of this happens is pretty likely, actually. Like statistically speaking, it's pretty likely that it's happened in other locations as well, in a very similar manner, multiple yeah, times. Yeah. I mean, we we're the only planet which has intelligent life on it that we know of, and so far our space exploration. I mean, they've explored so much of the universe. There's parts of the universe they haven't ha haven't explored. We have no idea how. How big it is yet despite all this advance in space technology they they still haven't found other life yeah good luck i i just i it could be could be but you know again we're st speaking about statistics here and the like uh, i've heard that the universe is infinite i don't know what that means exactly but if you think about that man infinite is like Infinite means there could be another Earth that's exactly like the one we're in right now, in which you and I are talking to each other the exact same way we're talking right now, except I have an Asian accent, and that's the only difference in the entire whole universe. <laughs> hmm. And then there's another planet. There's an infinite amount of those, and there's infinite amounts of other alternate, you know, Earths, if you will, where you're wearing a red shirt, or I have my hair parted down the middle, or 
your forehead's more shiny and less shiny. And, you know, like there's – so like that's infinite. That's – I mean start trying to wrap your mind around that. That's not going to – you're not going to be able to wrap your mind around that when you really, really start breaking it down in numbers. And the fact that we haven't found anybody else just only strengthens the whole argument that the universe is freaking huge and – we're so far away from anything that's even remotely like us that we just have we just assume we're the only ones. That's that's quite an arrogant position to take. Yeah. And the other argument that's that's put forward in this debate is that or against evolution, that oh there's a whole bunch of fossils missing from the evolution process. Well, we're not gonna find find them all, but it's made a pretty strong case what what they've been able to construct about evolution over the earth's time that would, like oh. that would be like saying well we didn't find all of the bodies of the serial killer so he probably didn't do it <laughs> <laughs> you know we found like two or three of them we're pretty sure it was him but it's not enough evidence we did we didn't have all of the bodies we didn't follow <laughs> the entire line <laughs> Now, you've put your atheism to the test. You did a, a God uh, debate with James Fox Higgins of the, the Rational Rise, which was moderated by Dear Beltran. I'm not sure how uh, impartial she was, given her own uh, biases. <laughs> but how did you rate your performance in that debate? My performance? Um, you know, as far as debates are concerned, um, James James is a very uh, challenging opponent. I mean, he, he brings his A game. He's very intelligent. He, he does his homework. It was probably the most challenging debate that I've had to date um, because he is, you know, so well educated and does know his shit. As far as my performance goes, I, I feel like I did pretty well. I mean, I held my I held my own. I held my ground. I don't feel like we convinced each other of anything in particular, but it, it was it was interesting the way that um, he kept kind of insulting me without knowing he was insulting me. Yeah, yeah, he, he does that. It was kind of this, oh, bless his heart kind of condescension that I don't think he was even aware he was doing. And I know he comes from a good place. He's a he's a great guy. And, and I love him to death, but it was like, all right, all right, come on now, you get <laughs> let's 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 uh, slow down a little bit here. I feel like my opening arguments was probably, uh, you know, I worked my ass off on those, and I feel like they're pretty irrefutable, and I don't feel like those points ever really really got addressed throughout the entire discussion. And it was live as well. There was no room for right. It was live. That was intense. It was so much fun though. I really enjoyed it. Now, you've written a few uh, fake news uh, guides. The, the mainstream media has put together a list of what they consider fake news, and you didn't put together a fake news list. You put together a guide to, to spotting uh, fake news. Can you just describe that? Yeah, basic, basically, you know, when the whole idea of fake news came about, I started asking myself, okay, how do... How would I? How do I know whether or not what I'm reading is true or not? Like, what measures do I take, and what rules do I follow to to make sure that what I'm reading is legit, or at least you know I can kind of pick uh, read between the lines of the impartiality that's that's involved in a lot of these stories. And so I ended up deciding it's you know I'm going to create like this ultimate guide, like this huge guide of all the different things that you can look for, watch out for, uh, um, uh, even some personal preferences. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the news source is fake or not, but it, it's something that I kind of, you know, take notice of. One of the big things that I've noticed a lot is the more fake the news source is, the more likely they are to have disabled the comments section. That was a pretty interesting one for me. And a lot of times, instead of just, you know, before I even read the article, I'll scroll down and see what other people are saying about the article before I'll even read it. And if there's no comment section at all, I'll just click out. I'm not even going to waste my time because you're writing an article and you're not allowing people on the article in the location where it's at to have a rebuttal or to be able to argue against or for what you're saying. Like that doesn't give me confidence that you're confident in what you're putting out as news content. The main thing that jumps out at me to to know if if something's fake news, if it, I wouldn't say it will jump to conclusions is a too general term, but it makes these links and like link link if this person's linked to this person then they must be this person and this was i think on full display during the uh, the, the proud boys campaign against 
against them. They're, they was basically saying, well, this person who was once associated with the Proud Boys did something bad and say, this is proof that they're, they're all bad. And there was a particularly bad uh, piece of journalism in one of our newspapers once. There was this rally in Brisbane against uh, what's called the Safe Schools Program, which is introducing students to LGBT concepts. And this was organized by a Patriot nationalist group, the True Blue Crew, and because one of their members had once been associated with Nazism, because a politician spoke at this rally against safe schools, they were, the headline said they spoke at a neo-Nazi rally. That, that's, I think, the <laughs> most blatant form of fake news saying, but because there is this six degree separation that somebody's bad, that proves that they're all bad, and so I'm able to put this headline together, justify it. Hey, it, can you believe that people buy that shit? Like, people read that and go, that must be true. Mm. Okay. <laughs> like, no, no, no questions, no curiosity, no doubt, nothing. Just, okay, that seems legit. He's a racist, because, mm. Mm. you know, I already felt like I disagree with the guy. He must be a racist, too. <laughs> like, that's so, that's so lazy. That's so lazy. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> like I, I, I love I love that the fact that our, that article headline was kind of kind of a, which I talked about in the article was was the idea of an appeal to emotion. Like you're just trying to exploit the emotion of the reader and and trying to take advantage of that and and kind of hoping that maybe they won't even read the article that they'll just read the headline, share it, and the news spreads. Like that that that's not that's not honest. I mean, there, there's so many examples of you know just. They'll, they'll use these words that aren't factually accurate, and even if they are factually accurate, they're, they're just put there as a way to try to uh, create this narrative or try to spin this story and make you feel a certain way. And if you're reading an article and it's making you angry, it may not have – you know, you might stop and ask yourself, is it because I'm actually passionate about this topic that's being discussed? Or is it because of the subtle language that's being used to manipulate my emotions to get me angry? And if they can't pin something on somebody they don't like directly, they'll do guilt by association. Well, they once associated with this person who's a known drug dealer or, or whatever, saying, well, we, we, we don't have any evidence that they've done anything wrong, but hey, they once had this connection with somebody who's turned out to do something really bad. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty common, and it's it's kind of like the new the new way of reporting news now. It just seems too, I don't know. It's just um, like Rachel Maddow over the last two years. I, I, I listen to her her podcast periodically, and it's like every single episode, every single episode, she starts out well. It turns out today is another busy, busy news day, and we've got lots of twists and turns in the in the Mueller probe. And it's like, wait, so. Everything, everything she talks about is this guy did this and it was connected to that bank and da 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 and therefore Trump is guilty. Like that's that's the through line through the whole thing. This guy's connected here. This guy knows that guy. This guy did that bad thing and this guy broke this law. Therefore, Trump's bad. <laughs> like every single time. It's like come on. Maybe it's possible these guys made their own decisions and were just doing bad things and maybe they really had nothing to do with Trump whatsoever, but you're so desperate, so desperate to bring this guy down that you can't see it any other way. And of course, I most people don't follow the news as closely as we do and we're able to to pick apart these these articles when they they pop up, but of course most people are uninformed, busy, working, have other interests, and when they read something where it says, oh, th this person, they are this type of person because of these, these, and these associations, and you shouldn't like them, then they automatically consume it because they've been conditioned to trust the local newspaper, the, the TV station, they've, they've been told to, that that's who you go to for information, that's where your parents and grandparents got it. Man, man, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I guess I, I would be curious to know, what do you think would be like your solution for all this, if there is a solution? Because I, I think too many people are just headline readers. They, they fall into the same pattern constantly over and over again. It's like something's going to have to change, man, because all of these rumors and all these fake news stories is 
becoming people's reality, and that's just not the case. Well, we're doing our bit. We just need to send the, the mainstream media broke. That's what we've got to do. We've seen the, the mainstream media in, in Australia struggle uh, to a degree. We had two of our major uh, news companies, Nine Entertainment and Fairfax, merge. And of course, when, when two media companies merge, everyone says media concentration, but they were merging because they needed to survive and so obviously they're draining revenue because of online and alternative news and so i see that as a a good development hopefully this new super company will will meet the same fate as the other two separate companies yeah i, I agree with you there i i feel like you know i was sitting there wondering like how in the world are these major media companies able to bring in millions and millions of dollars and their viewership is going down. There's po there's podcasts and YouTube channels that are doing way better in terms of viewership and numbers, and they're not even making anywhere near that. And it's like you got to follow the money at some point. You got to understand. Okay, so the owner of Amazon, um, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, owns the Washington Post. Like, you got to ask yourself. Okay, why is that? Why is that that the the owner of Amazon also has uh, defense contracts with the CIA uh, to the tunes of millions and millions of dollars. Like, it doesn't necessarily make their news fake or not, but it certainly should give you pause that maybe they have a certain bias or, or, or at least take that into consideration when reading the articles. Like, oh, okay, so there's some certain things that this particular news media outlet can't say or risk their revenue stream because that's the only way they're surviving. That's the only way they're paying these news anchors like millions of dollars in their contracts every year. And it's been noticeable in the, the Trump age, these mainstream media outlets, they they don't want politics to, to change at all. They, they don't like that Trump's disrupting things. And it's like, oh, how dare he interrupt the, the deep state or all of these foreign policies and military operations we have uh, overseas. How dare he try to have uh, friendly relations with, with Russia? And of course we saw with the uh, death of George H.W. Bush, I mean, what well, he was a CIA director, was saying, oh, this was how politics used to be and how good and great it was the mainstream media told us. Good lord, that that's such utter bullshit. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, you know, I, I, it it really bothers me when they sit there and make this huge fanfare about the passing of presidents. Like, I get it. Yeah, the guy was the president of the United States. That's fantastic. But why should his death be any more important than, say, the soldiers that we sacrificed to these? Uh, but John these McCain's soldiers. death, that was, everyone said, what a, a great giant of American politics he was. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. But, I'm, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, the average soldier. You know, every single life that's sacrificed should be held up with as much fanfare, if not more. That's that's way more of a brave thing to do. I would argue some in some cases just kind of manipulated and stupid, but it's brave. You got to have balls to be able to go do that. Yeah, I, I mean, I just I just don't I just don't. It's it's like every time one of these people dies, like everybody's like got to scramble to you know go hire a speechwriter and come up with the most positive things they can say about them. Even though everybody who followed along throughout their presidency knows it's entire like it's it's all just complete, total utter bullshit. And the younger generation now is like, oh, he sounds like a great guy. So they don't even bother going back and looking into it like, oh, well, wow, this guy really did some terrible shit. Like <laughs> he was a president. Of course he did. He's he's the owner. He's basically the head of the monopoly on violence. <laughs> like, of course, they did something terrible. <laughs> they did a lot of things terrible. And now that brings me on to the next topic, which is Trump. I mentioned he's been a great uh, disruptor, and obviously you're an anarchist, you don't want anyone to, to be the, the US president, so every US president is not your president. But the reason why, why I like Trump, and I am critical of him when he does bad things, when he does break promises, I call him out on it, but the fact that he has made all these establishment people so scared that the fact that we're supposed to consider it a a grave horrendous occurrence that he said about Miku 
Gravinsky that uh, she was bleeding badly from a facelift and that uh, Megan Kelly had bl blood coming out of her wherever. We're told that this is the, the worst thing that's that's ever happened in American politics and yet all these other presidents have, you know, killed thousands of people flying drones over countries that that's apparently fine we we're just talking about the the previous presidents who'd started wars that that's apparently all fine but apparently uh saying outrageous things that's that, that that's basically the worst thing ever oh yeah let's let's so basically basically uh what trump has done he, he's like this, this marketing genius he's he's amazing in terms of just simplifying a message breaking it down to a few monosyllabic you know short sweet build the wall three syllables each word is nice and simple your your common kindergartner could repeat it in fact i've seen videos where little kids are like yeah trump's gonna build the wall <laughs> like it's like they get it like it doesn't matter how dumb you are you get this you understand exactly what is being talked about you understand exactly what the end goal here is it's marketing genius it's fantastic and he's done this job of going in and making it look like you know he's like the little kid in the emperor's new clothes that says hey why isn't he wearing any clothes and the whole media establishes the, the entire media establishment and the political establishment is like Yes, we are. Yeah, we are. What are you talking about? <laughs> like, mm. like mm. you don't get to do no, no, don't point that out. We can't handle that. <laughs> it's like, what what do you guys do? Like, I, I love the guy in terms of, of that, the disruptive nature of it all, the terms of exposing what it is. I mean, after after Donald Trump has taken office, the amount of the, the percentage of people that now at least have heard the term deep state or at least believe it to be true has increased like they get it like people are starting to wake up and understand it now that's in my view a fantastic move toward what should be an ultimately peaceful society and the other note i wanted to, to point out is like you said about the drone strikes let's not focus on what's the real problem over here well i'm sitting here i was just thinking about this yesterday is is, is they've been going through this whole back and forth about the funding for the wall well the house has approved this 5.7 billion dollars for the wall and now it goes to the senate and now we got to hope to get their votes and but we could do the nuclear option and people are like what's the nuclear option i don't know what that is and they're starting to kind of get educated about the process uh, it has been a great exercise in civil learning how our civil society is supposed to work it's like a civics course you know but the problem is the wall is not a problem the wall is not the issue the wall is a focal point to keep people distracted from the fact that we're going to hit an ec economic collapse in the next few years that makes the Great Depression look like child's play. Like there's we're so over leveraged in debt right now. And, you know, they're talking about five billion dollars. How about that? Like 200 plus trillion dollars that were, you know, overextended in unfunded liabilities. How about we focus on something that's really going to have an impact on your life no matter where you're at in the United States? Arguably, no matter where you're at in the entire world. Let's focus on that, huh? How many trillion dollars is the US in debt now? I can't keep up. I should have checked the, the debt clock. It, it, the official the official prop uh, number, I think, right now is like 21 trillion or something like that. It's like way, way, way uh, lower than what people say it is. It's, it's not, it's, I mean, I'm sorry, if, if you actually look at the real numbers and what's going on here, you're looking at a number way, way higher than that. I, I've heard estimates as high as over 200 trillion dollars well that's with unfunded liabilities medicare medicaid and social security yeah, yeah. um right now the uh, according to the debt clock it's 21 trillion dollars 21.33 billion dollars and everyone stopped talking about it the media stopped talking about it because orange man bad and it's well the the establishment politicians on both sides they've done nothing to to stop the debt over the past 25 years yeah so so while, while i'm here let, let me let me read off some other numbers here from uh, this is from Na nationaldebtclocks.org the national debt per citizen per citizen that's not per adult that's per citizen is $65,781 i'm sitting here thinking good god man i've got there's six of us I can't even imagine trying to pay off that amount of money. <laughs> That's ridiculous. The debt as a percent of GDP, let's do the math on this, is 108.1%. Okay? 
let's do the math on that. If you're only, if you're bringing in, if 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 the amount of money I bring in every year is fifty thousand dollars, that's a hundred percent. But I'm spending fifty five thousand every year. Like, at what point do I ever get back in under control? Like, this is only going to continue to get worse. Like, it's only going to continue to spiral out of control, and it can only continue to get higher and higher because you know what happens with compound interest rates. Like, it's if anybody <laughs> doesn't understand the power of compound interest rates, we're we're screwed. Like, like this is not looking good, and you should prepare accordingly. Like now. And like you said, nobody is talking about the the debt at all. It's just everything's become consumed by the war the the media and the establishment has it has against trump they they just don't want to to mention it at, at all and it, the can's just being kicked down the road oh yeah yeah that's that's all that's going to happen man just <laughs> it's, it's going to keep going because because honestly to, in order to do the work that needs to be done in order to get ourselves back on a on a path that's you know positive in nature no politician in their right mind would ever do it it's just not going to happen i mean you're talking about not not only the the risk of not being reelected which is a, an existential crisis for politicians to begin with but you're also talking about the fact that you're you're more than likely going to have to deal with riots in the streets and chaos like true chaos that's not where that's not where anybody wants to that's not the kind of thing that anybody wants to have laid at their feet in terms of blame and and just just for just for clarity's sake by the way the, the australian debt clock is a uh, 612 billion it's not even a trillion dollars um, yeah, convert to yeah. us sorry convert to usd we're looking at less than half a trillion 434 billion dollars Oh, we're supposed to be getting a budget surplus by next year, so that's one of the things that Australia yeah. is somewhat better than the, the US back. We actually talk about uh, getting the, the budget balance, which is... I, I just... would love to have your national debt per citizen at $17,602. That's fantastic. I would, I would much rather have that. <laughs> yeah, it's not too bad after all. And and as compa and as as a comparison, remember the U.S. was at one hundred and eight percent. Yours is currently at thirty one percent. Like that's mm. pretty manageable. That's pretty. I mean, in terms of like personal credit, a twenty four percent interest rate on a on a, a an average like store credit card is like ooh, that's kind of a lot. Like that, that'll that'll tear you up if you let it get out of control. A twenty twenty four percent, you know, thirty one percent. That's pretty. You know, we can we can deal with that. You know, it's 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 not gonna be easy, but we can deal with that. But 108%, that's mathematically not possible. <laughs> that's not going to work. Don't, don't give the Australian government too, <laughs> too many ideas. They, they might want to keep going into debt. <laughs> ah, screw it. Burn it all down. Burn it all down. Just kidding. No, that would be not good. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed uh, chatting with you oh, today or tonight or tomorrow, wherever it is around our various uh, locations i'll of course like all of our viewers and listeners to check out unframe of mind you've got a website youtube uh, you're on the podcasting platforms on facebook and twitter yep you can find me everywhere all all my all my handles are at unframe of mind nice and simple and i hope that we can chat on a more regular basis yeah absolutely i'd be glad to, i'd be glad to come on and then contribute in whatever way whatever way you need me to. I'll, I'll come on there and i'll sing and i'll dance and we'll put on a cabaret and you know we'll just uh, make it up uh, <laughs> no nah, maybe not that far oh well all right all right <laughs> gotta give the people what they want man <laughs> i don't know maybe one day i'll get experimental there you go there you go all right tim man man i, I appreciate you having me on the show dude anytime all right, everybody, that's the show for today. We've still got some big names on their way to tour Australia. Dr. Stephen Hicks, who was on this show last week, his Adventures in Postmodernism tour is starting from March the 9th, and he is visiting Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, and Adelaide. And unlike other tours, the tickets are well within everyone's budget, and it includes a photo with Stephen, as well as the opportunity to get your book signed at no extra charge. So excellent value. So go to truearrowevents.com and make sure you use the coupon code POMO to get a 10% discount on tickets. 
There is also the Conversation About Feminism Tour featuring bad feminist Roxane Gay and factual feminist Christina Hoff Summers, which should prove to be a lively debate. I'm seeing a lot of ads for it on Facebook, so it is certainly being billed as a big event. The Unshackled is also once again going to be a sponsor of the latest Liberty Fest conference, which is being held in Perth for the first time, organised by our good friends at Liberty Works. It is on the 8th and 9th of March, and you can book your place by going to libertyfest.org.au. Remember that The Unshackled can only continue and to expand with the support of our followers. There are plenty of ways to support us. You can pledge over at Patreon at patreon.com slash The Unshackled and directly via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled. We also have our premium membership option on our website, which is theunshackled.net slash support options slash premium membership. We are still waiting for our Subscribestar account to be approved, so we'll be launching that shortly. And of course, there is our online store uprightmarket.com where you can purchase right thinking merchandise which also helps support the unshackled so thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time thanks for tuning in to the unshackled waves please visit the unshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show don't forget to pick up your free ebook at the unshackled battlefield.net and keep checking out the unshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.